on World News Tonight. Escalating attacks. The search for survivors continues as fallout from the ongoing conflict in Ukraine is causing heavy damage to its citizens and infrastructure. The assault goes on with no end in sight. NATO blamed. The blame game is warming up as nations now look for more causes of the origin of this conflict. Some nations pressure NATO to take the fall of the crisis, stating the organization is responsible for the tensions. Solemn remembrance. The war in Ukraine leaves a heavy price to pay on the innocents. Civilians and military personnel alike feel the toll of those lost amid mass burials across the nation. And a weighted return. Following a pandemic pause, St. Patrick's Day is back to being full of cheers and joy. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News tonight. Our top story still leads with the updates on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine and Russia have entered their fourth week of war and still unanswered is why. What is clear is that this is not the fight that Russia has expected as casualties are high and their objectives are unrealized and their apparent systemic assault on civilians knows no end. In the latest, even signage which was visible from air warning that children were among those sheltering in a theater in Mariupol failed to prevent its bombing with over 700 civilians including 50 children dying. As the war in Ukraine enters its fourth week, residents are getting used to waking up to scenes of destruction. This building in Kyiv was damaged by what authorities said was debris from a missile shot down in the early hours of the morning. Emergency services workers searched through the rubble looking for survivors. Not everyone managed to escape unharmed. Emergency services said at least one person was killed and three wounded after the 16-storey building was hit. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, addressed the German Bundestag by video link, pulling no punches in a speech that invoked the Holocaust and the Berlin Wall and seemed intended to shame pro-Russian politicians in Moscow's main energy buyer. After 80 years, this is happening again. And I implore you, every year, politicians repeat the words, never again. And now, we see that these words are worth nothing. A people in Europe is being destroyed. They are trying to destroy everything we hold dear. In the besieged city of Mariupol, local officials said a theatre where several women and children were sheltering had been bombed by Russian forces on Wednesday. This satellite image shows the theatre before the attack. The word children can be seen written in Russian outside. Mayoral advisor Petro Adroshenka told by phone that the bomb shelter had held and that there were survivors. Russia denied striking the theatre. As bombardments continue, Western countries said on Thursday that Russian forces were no longer making gains on the ground. British military intelligence said Russian forces were suffering heavy losses from a staunch and well-coordinated Ukrainian resistance. Moscow said on Thursday peace talks with Ukraine were continuing via video link. Although both sides have pointed to limited progress in peace talks this week, President Vladimir Putin showed little sign of relenting. In a televised speech, he condemned traitors and scum at home who helped the West and said the Russian people would spit them out like gnats. Moscow says it is carrying out a special operation to disarm and denazify Ukraine. Kyiv and its Western allies believe Russia launched the unprovoked war to subjugate a neighbour Putin calls an artificial state. Now Russia says it has made payments due on two bonds, but some creditors say the funds haven't even been received, leaving it unclear whether the country faces its first default on international debt in more than a century. Russia may be on the brink of its first default on international debts since the Bolshevik Revolution more than a century ago. On Thursday, the state of play was far from clear. The previous day, Moscow had been due to pay $117 million in interest payments on two dollar-denominated bonds. 
Some creditors told that the funds had not been received. A raft of international sanctions complicates the already complex transactions involved, not least as Russia's central bank is among the institutions targeted. However, the Kremlin insists the payments have been made. Officials said Thursday that they would update the market later on whether the money had reached Citibank, the payment agent. There was no immediate comment from the bank's relevant branch in London. Russia's finance ministry has said it will make payments in rubles if it can't transfer dollars due to sanctions. However, ratings agency Fitch says that would still constitute a default if it's not corrected within a 30-day grace period. That could rock global markets, and many more such dramas may lie ahead. Russia has 15 international bonds outstanding, with a face value of around $40 billion. The Kremlin says it has plenty of money to make payments, and says that means that any default would be totally artificial. As the war escalates further, hundreds of Ukrainians are set to arrive in Australia and will need a place to stay and there are fears support systems set up by local communities could be overwhelmed. Let's cross over to other than a world special correspondent Timothy Phillip from Melbourne in Australia for more details on this. Timothy. Yes, I'm right. The Ukrainian big body in Australia has so far received more than 250 requests for accommodation from people fleeing the Russian invasion with the majority expected to arrive within days. The Office of the Immigration Minister, Alex Hawke, said more than 4,000 Australian visas have been issued to Ukrainians since the Russian incursion began on 24 February. And of those visa holders, more than 500 people have traveled to Australia. She warned the flow of people out of Ukraine has only just begun, and soon cracks would emerge in the community's volunteer-run systems. Most of the people arriving are women with young children and elderly people, as men aged between 18 and 60 are barred from leaving the Ukraine due to martial law. A Home Affairs Department spokesperson said immigration authorities had been focused on facilitating travel for people who needed to leave Ukraine urgently, and broad consideration was being given to visas for people once they have arrived in Australia. The government said humanitarian support options will be considered in conjunction with international organizations, including the UNHCR. Back to you, Anna. All right, thank you. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip from Melbourne in Australia. Holding NATO responsible for the war in Ukraine, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa said he would resist calls to condemn Russia for invading its neighbor. Speaking in Parliament, he said the war, which has entered its fourth week, could have been avoided if NATO hadn't expanded eastward. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa on Thursday blamed NATO for the war in Ukraine and said he would resist calls to condemn Russia. The war could have been avoided if NATO had heeded the warnings from amongst its own leaders and officials over the years that its eastward expansion would lead to greater, not less, instability in the region. Ramaphosa did also say that South Africa cannot condone the use of force and violation of international law, an apparent reference to Russia's February 24th invasion of Ukraine. Russia describes its action as a special operation to disarm and denazify Ukraine and counter what President Vladimir Putin calls NATO aggression. Kyiv and its Western allies believe Russia launched the unprovoked war to subjugate a neighbor that Putin calls an artificial state. Addressing members of parliament, Ramaphosa said he had heard from Putin himself that negotiations between Russia and Ukraine were making progress. For us, this is an important development. Whilst other people scream and shout, we want to focus on the outcome, the positive outcome of those negotiations and that mediation process. That is what is important. Last week, Ramaphosa's office said South Africa had been asked to mediate in the conflict and that he had told Putin it should be settled through negotiations. It did not say who had asked Ramaphosa to intervene. 
But his comments on Thursday now cast doubt on whether he would be accepted in such a role by Ukraine or the West. Ukraine is going through a traumatizing period as funerals have been taking place in Ukrainian town of Ochakiv, one of the first places targeted by the Russian invasion. Three weeks into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and the first of Ochakiv's fallen soldiers are finally being laid to rest. In this military town located on the Black Sea coast, day one of the war claimed the lives of 24 troops. Some of their bodies still haven't been recovered. It took several days to identify Anatoly Vasilyevich's son. He was killed one week into the war when four rockets shut down his helicopter. While shelling has reduced in Ochakiv compared to the early days of the invasion, Attacks still occur here daily. The city's trauma is palpable. Streets are deserted with dozens of civilians being evacuated every day by bus. Those who remain pray for a ceasefire. This is not the first time soldiers in Ochakiv have paid the ultimate price for war. In the city centre stands a memorial paying tribute to dozens of the city's soldiers killed in the Donbass since fighting started there in 2014. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. A Russian-European mission to land a rover on Mars has been suspended due to the Kremlin's invasion of the Ukraine. The European Space Agency announced as Moscow said it regretted the bitter decision. Is there life on Mars? It's a question put on pause for the European Space Agency as its council unanimously agrees on the indefinite suspension of the ExoMars mission following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. While recognizing the impact on scientific exploration of space, ESA is fully aligned with the sanctions imposed on Russia by its member states. The launch of Europe's first planetary rover, called Rosalind Franklin after the British chemist, was coordinated with Russia's state space corporation Roscosmos. Designed to look for life on Mars, it was originally scheduled to launch summer 2020, delayed by the coronavirus pandemic. Despite the suspension, the ESA said the International Space Station continues its normal operations. The main goal is to continue safe operations of the ISS, including maintaining the safety of the crew. There are currently four American NASA astronauts, two Russian cosmonauts and one European astronaut on board, with three more Russian cosmonauts joining the crew. The space station's manager, Joel Montabano, said there are no signs of tensions between the crew members. You know, when you're in space, there, there's no borders. You don't see, you don't see uh, country lines or state lines. So the teams continue to work together. Are they aware of what's going on on Earth? Absolutely. Uh, but the teams are professional. The ESA says the Director General, Joseph Ashbacher, will host an extraordinary meeting in the coming weeks as Russia's invasion continues. Even as the number of COVID cases fall, there is growing concern on yet another potential COVID wave in the United States as Omicron subvariant drives cases way up overseas. It comes as once again Americans try to return to normal. The record rise in new COVID cases overseas is tonight spawning renewed concern around the globe. Omicron subvariant BA2 appears to be fueling new infections in the Western Pacific, African and European regions. But the WHO says the 11 million new cases are just the tip of the iceberg as fewer people are testing. With data from several countries, including the UK, showing sharp spikes in cases around the same time, here at home, restrictions have just been loosened. The fact is that COVID may not be done with us. It's going to be around for a while. We'll have to deal with it. But you're right. There will not be an appetite for people to go back to a masking situation. So let's try and avoid that by doing other things. Trying to prevent the next surge, the White House is seeking $22.5 billion in COVID funding. But many lawmakers have balked at the price tag for more boosters, testing, treatments and variant research. Well, it's absolutely critical. We will not be able to do the kind of research to address the inevitable next variant 
if we don't get the funding that we're talking about. I have to tell you, we need more than that. Tonight, as Americans enjoy better days that are finally here, worrisome times could also lie ahead. The South Korean authorities have announced that they're slightly relaxing the social distancing rules to allow social gatherings of up to eight people rather than just six. But still, this is a questionable move as the nation is reaching its highs on COVID cases. South Korea hit a record daily COVID-19 high with more than 600,000 new cases and 429 deaths, authorities said on Thursday. But the country that once held an aggressive stance against COVID-19 is set to end restrictions. The Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency said the highly infectious Omicron variant was driving the wave of infections. Despite the numbers, the government shows no sign of rethinking plans to remove almost all social distancing restrictions in coming days and weeks, and public opinion appears to support those moves. The country has pushed back a curfew on eateries to 11 p.m., stopped enforcing vaccine passes, and plans to drop a quarantine for vaccinated travelers arriving from overseas. A decision on whether to ease further measures, such as a current six-person limit on private gatherings, is expected as early as Friday. South Korea also mandates masks in all public indoor and outdoor spaces. Though it never adopted a zero-COVID policy and never imposed wide lockdowns, South Korea once used aggressive tracking, tracing and quarantines to control new cases. Nearly 63 percent of the country's 52 million residents had received booster shots, officials said, with 86 percent of the population fully vaccinated. Tensions have flared in recent weeks in Havana as Cubans seeking to leave have seen their plans threatened by rising ticket prices and fresh visa requirements. Protests like this reflect growing tension and frustration in Cuba as a flood of people trying to leave the country face new travel blocks. Every time I come to my village, 10 people have left. Relatives, friends, neighbors. It's hard to get up in the morning and find that you're not going to see them anymore. It all started when Nicaragua lifted visa requirements for Cuba in November. Many dropped everything, sold their homes, and raced to Havana's airport all in hopes of joining the so-called migrant highway through Central America to the United States. But that in turn led to soaring airfares along with fresh visa requirements in travel hubs like Colombia, Panama and Costa Rica. Jorge Duani is a migration expert with Florida International University. We see a very precarious situation for most of the Cuban population. Thousands of these people surely have no other way out of this economic crisis than to leave the country. So they seek different ways, for example, by traveling to Russia to eventually cross the border into Europe. Cuba has blamed the United States for the uptick in illegal immigration, saying the country's policies, including the Cold War era embargo, encourages Cubans to risk their lives to leave the island. More than 16,000 Cubans were apprehended at the border in February, a monthly record, according to U.S. figures. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Peru's top constitutional court ruled that former President Alberto Fujimori can be freed from prison where he had been sentenced to serve until 2032 for human rights violations. Chinese authorities deployed mass COVID-19 testing and boosted the construction of makeshift hospitals as infections continue to rise across the country. Moderna sought emergency use authorization with U.S. health regulators for a second COVID-19 booster shot as a surge in cases in some parts of the world fuel feels of another wave of the pandemic. A dramatic sandstorm was seen engulfing the Diego Almaguero commune in Chile, leaving 9,161 homes temporarily without power. Sales of electric cars in South Korea have more than doubled on year in February. In a bid to encourage more drivers to go green, the Environment Ministry is holding an electric vehicle expo in Seoul. Devotees across India marked the Hindu festival of colours Holi, during which they smeared each other with colours, danced and sang across the country. People play Holi after lighting a holy fire, which is worshipped as a symbol of victory of good over evil.
And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you've missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with visuals of the return of St. Patrick's Day celebrations as many gather around to see the parade after a two-year absence due to the COVID pandemic. Thank you for watching. Good night.